Welcome. Hello to everybody. My name is Prem Gill and I'm the CEO at Creative BC. If you're not familiar with who we are, we are the organization that receives funding from the province to support the development of the film, television, and creative industries more broadly here in British Columbia. And that includes visual effects and animation. So we're really excited uh, to talk a bit about that today. Today is our first uh, session we call Greet 10, which is part of our Creative Pathways project. Creative Pathways is a website we launched uh, just about a week ago in its full form, which is really here to help demystify what, how do you find jobs in the film industry? What are the different types of opportunities and experiences? How, what kind of education do you need? And really, um, you know, a place for people to go, anybody really, and you don't even have to be working in British Columbia to really understand what is it like, where do I even start, and what are some of those jobs? And today we've got a lovely esteemed panel of folks from the visual effects and animation industry. I'm actually here today in my office at the end of the day, which is located on the unceded territories of the Coast Salish people, the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh, and we're very honored to be here. So I welcome all, all of you. If anybody else is interested in sharing which territory they are tuning in from, please, um, you know, do that. And uh, a couple of little bits of housekeeping. Um, I'm going to introduce the panel in a, in a minute or so here, and we'll be having a conversation with each of them. For, they will share their experiences, what they do in the industry, uh, how they hire people, and how to enter. If you are, if you have any questions, please use the chat, and I'll be keeping an eye on that to bring us into the, hopefully bring it into the conversation. And uh, what was the other item, Kat? Uh, we're going to be launching a poll in a, in a minute. And that is really for us and the panelists to understand who's tuning in today and what your interests might be. So uh, Kat, do you want to do that now? Yeah, I'm just going to Can you do it while I keep talking? Yep. Yes. Okay. It's as if I haven't done a few of these over the last couple of years. So there you go. If you can see it, very simple. Uh, please go ahead and fill that out. It'll just take you a few 20 seconds or so to do that. Um, and other housekeeping we will, so this panel will end at 6 p.m. because uh, I'm sure everybody will be ready for their, you know, pre-dinner snack or walk while the, the skies are, are not raining on us this afternoon. Um, but why don't I start introducing folks here? So we've got such a broad range of interesting people here with us today. Uh, Crystal Wu, who is a junior art director at Kickstart Entertainment. Welcome, Crystal. Abrao Segundo, who is a senior character artist at Ripple Effect Studio. Heather Padak, from, also from Kickstart, the president of Kickstart Entertainment, so welcome. Dane Larock, the senior creature modeler at ILM. So um, you're going to tell us all about the child, as I know, we don't follow the baby Yoda, but the child. Um, Spencer, if you're listening, I pay attention to those things. Um, Clara Chan, uh, CG supervisor from Sony Imageworks, and Lori Blavin from the uh, global head of talent acquisition at Scanline Visual Effects. So um, hello and welcome everybody. The other thing I would note is um, congratulations to all the artists over the years who've worked in many, I, if some of you are tuning in, uh, so many projects we were commenting on before we came online that get nominated for awards like the Oscars and many others are artists or projects that were worked on by many talented people here in British Columbia, including last night's visual effects win uh, for June, the, the gang from DNEG, Double Negative, but also the team at Sony Imageworks had two nominations last night for uh, Meet the Mitchells and Spider-Man. So uh, we're always very proud of all of that work. Um, and I know that, um, you know, particularly I think uh, Heather, when uh, I'm going to come to you in a moment, but your company also develops IP, I think, right? It's your own content. So I think that's also um, another thing that we don't often think about because it is not as, um, I'm not going to say not as simple, but it's a different journey creating animation than it is live action, uh, especially if you are a creator yourself. So we're going to get started here and I'm actually going to start with you, Heather. So tell us about Kickstart Entertainment, um, how, you know, in, in this 
you know, Multiverse of British Columbia, how you started, uh, how, when you started this company and, and how that kind of came about. Yeah, so the short version is that I fell into the business. I took a temp job. I had no idea what animation was whatsoever. And I just got hooked. I thought it was such a vast industry. I'm not an artist myself, but I always had a love of art. I always took art classes. Um, I wouldn't hire me as an artist, uh, but I'd hire me as a producer. Um, and so I kind of just fell into the business. And yeah, I, I went to LA for a couple of years and learned the industry, uh, how hard it was down there. And then I quickly came back to Vancouver in about 2000, uh, 2007, and I co-founded Kickstarts um, Canadian studio here. Uh, so that's like the mini version of how this all came to be. And yeah, for the last, gosh, I guess it's been almost 15 years now, we've been uh, running a studio here. It started with two people, myself and one other person in Yale Town. And now we've grown to, um, not that you'd be able to tell from our MP studio right now, but we're running uh, five shows yes. here. And wow. we've got about we flux up and down depending on what our crew sizes are between usually around 75 to just over 100 in Vancouver. That's um, full-time staff members, part-time staff, uh, and a lot of contractors that we work with as well. That's great. So I want to come back to you after on how and where you source talent from. Um, but Lori, you are you have a big job at a fairly large studio at Scanline, which is international. You have uh, studios all over the world, don't you? We do, yes. Yeah. So how, you know, again, tell us a little bit about your journey, but also, you know, what the approach has been in, in you know, what has become quite a competitive talent space here, especially here in Vancouver. Well, I think much like Heather, my career is a little bit of an accident. Yeah. Uh, my name's Lori Blavin. I'm actually talking to you from Los Angeles today. And Scanline has offices in um, Vancouver, Montreal, two offices in Germany, London, Los Angeles, and Seoul, Korea. Um, in addition to that, we have people working remotely almost on every continent on the globe right now uh, because of COVID. But uh, I originally was director of design at AOL and then went on to start a couple of startups. And I took some time off after my kid was born and I thought, you know, oh, I was always good at finding great talent. Maybe if I just take that little tiny sliver of what I normally do, I'll have more time to be present with my family. Um, that was not the case. How did that go? I was <laughs> <laughs> no, it just expanded to fill the forum. But um, I, I jumped in actually uh, at a little company called The Orphanage, which was a spinoff of people from ILM. And that was the beginning of my career in visual effects and I haven't looked back since. So um, it's been very exciting. And I actually was with Scanline 12 years ago, helped them build their LA office when there were only four of us. Uh, and I've just returned to them in the last couple of months since the uh, Netflix acquisition. Mm -hmm. Wow, well, that's, um, that's very exciting. I'm just, uh, I'm also curious. And again, I'll kind of come back to both to you and Heather on this, just on how the industry here has changed in those five years too, right? Because um, I think, you know, according to our numbers, the anywhere, depending on how many projects are happening at any time, the size of the number of people who work in visual effects and animation is anywhere from five to 10,000 people. So that's, you know, a, a number to be reckoned with in terms of the types of jobs and the competition for talent here. Um, Clara, welcome. And you are with Sony Imageworks. Can you tell us a little bit about your role? Sure. Um, I am a CG supervisor at Sony Pictures Imageworks. Um, in some other studio, they might call it lighting supervisor. I have been with Sony for 21 years now. Um, I moved from LA to Vancouver about seven years ago. Um, I started as a lighting artist. Uh, my first movie was Stuart Little 2, it's Little Mouse, and then <laughs> kind of just moved up the ladder within the company. Um, and I have been a CG supervisor for five animated features now, 
um, including the latest one, which is the Spider-Man across the Spider-Verse movie. Um, yeah, so at Sony, we do both visual effects and animated features. So we get to jump back and forth between the two different types of movies, which is really fun. Um, what a CG supervisor does is um, we lead a team of maybe 15, 20 people. Um, they do lighting and compositing and they are responsible for creating the final image you see on the big screen. Um, so my job is to give them creative directions and make sure that um, each individual artist, when they work on their own shot, it fits in the context of the whole sequence, the whole movie, and that they bring the vision of the client uh, to the big screen. Um, and then while we do that, there will be a lot of problems that come our way and I would help them to solve them. Um, give them the resources to make sure they get their job done. So Clara, just quickly, I, you know, on a movie like um, Spider-Verse, you would have like how many artists would be working on something <laughs> of that scale? That particular movie is huge. Yeah. Um, I would say just animation would be about 150 and then lighting another hundred. Um, and then there are all these other departments. So yeah. I would say five, 600. Yeah, that's, and how many years? Usually takes about two years um, yeah. for the production side. Uh, that's interesting. Okay, lots of questions in my head. We're gonna come back to some of that. I have to. I have to write some of this down because I'm going to forget. Um, Crystal, you are also um, your art, art director at um, Kickstart. You're working on some interesting projects right now, but what's your journey been into the industry? Yeah, so uh, I started at Kickstart as an intern about four years ago. Uh, I'm not quite an art director yet. I actually just started on a new project and I'm going to be training to become an art director soon. I just promoted you, Chris. Yeah, <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Heather, take note. <laughs> I'm very excited about that. Um, but I think I kind of got into animation. It was a bit serendipitous, I guess, because you know, as a child and as a teenager, I always consumed media like animation and movies and video games. And I kind of thought, you know, it'd be really cool to work on them, but I never thought about it seriously. Um, and when I went to university, my parents were like, you know, I have an older sibling, one's an engineer, one went into sciences. And so they were like, you need to get a degree too. We don't care what it is, but it has to be a degree. So I went to Simon Fraser, but you know, I was there for three, four years didn't enjoy doing it at all. I was doing computer programming. Um, and so I just decided, you know what, this isn't for me. I miss drawing, I miss being creative. So I took a year off and worked on my portfolio and I ended up going to um, Capilano for their graphic design program. And it just so happened that it also was the first year they introduced a concentration in illustration. And so that's what my concentration was in. And in my third year, they hired a new illustration teacher, um, Zoe Evamy, who is currently an art director at Atomic Cartoons. And so through her, I kind of got that connection and networking into animation. And so in my fourth year, when I had to do a practicum, um, Zoe was able to connect me to Kickstart Entertainment. And so I applied to be an intern there. And I've been here ever since working on like my dream job. That's so great. That's an excellent summary of how a journey um, can take place for somebody. So you were, I mean, I think this is the interesting part. I think a lot of us know young people and, you know, even like really young kids who love to draw or are super creative and you just don't know how to explain these types of jobs to people. What would, how would you explain this now to your younger self? Yeah, I think as my younger self, for some reason, I never really looked into animation. And it wasn't even until I started at Kickstart where I knew that there was such a big industry in Vancouver itself. Mm -hmm. And when I was younger, my parents would be like, we know you like drawing, but how are you going to make money drawing? And even <laughs> then I was like, I don't know, I'm just going to do it. <laughs> um, but I would really encourage people if, if, you know, if you have a passion for something and you want to make it your job, you just have to go out there and research it and look into it instead of just kind of thinking, oh, it's kind of a dream that I can't reach. Yeah, 
No, that is excellent uh, inspiration and advice. Dane, I think you had similar, not similar, but kind of as a young person, as a, young, as a kid, you also had an interest in, in uh, you know, other worlds. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely true. Uh, yeah, uh, hi everyone, my name is Dane LaRock and uh, my Métis kid who just is getting to live his dream now creating critters for big screen, which is pretty fun. <laughs> I uh, come from some very rural places, like middle of nowheres. Uh, and like what Crystal was saying, it's kind of funny, like it, the industry is so big here and it's amazing. Like, it's just, it's uh, it's kind of surprising when you're in it. Cause you're like, oh, wow, like this, this exists. Cause where I grew up, it was all, if you're either, you're either, you know, a cowboy, a welder or a farmer, like that was about, it. that was your options. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty like, it, it's, it's a pretty amazing uh, field to be in and creatively and, and all, all the above. But yeah, I, I came in just like everyone else, it seems like by accident where I just kind of like looked at, you know, colleges around here and uh, enrolled in the first one that came up. And I just kind of like fell into 3D modeling, which worked out kind of really in my favor. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, uh, I was uh, like, you know, I did construction and a whole bunch of other type of labor intensive jobs. I was in the oil patch. I did like farmhand. I did all that type of stuff, car restoration. And uh, if you actually kind of like reach out, like it's pretty impressive uh, how big the industry is here. And I, yeah, I took the plunge and been been here ever since and loving it ever since. Yeah, it is interesting. Everybody's accidental for many of you kind of entrance into the industry. So, you know, reading your bio, you were you know, like, so many young people at the time, you know, Lord mm -hmm. of the Rings, Star Wars, all of these, um, you know, uh, name brand or properties that had such an influence on, you know, so many young people. And you're in, you know, rural Alberta, British Columbia, like, but you knew you wanted to go to college or to university. And that was that sort of your first, like, even though you couldn't necessarily understand or articulate that this was a pot potential career. Yeah, I don't know. I was always like that kid drawing in the corner. I I was the, the worst student ever in school because I'd like I'd come back with my homework to hand in. And instead of anything filled into where we were supposed to write, it was just drawings in every empty space. And that's like that was me. Yeah. But uh, I I don't know. Like I might come from like a hardcore Western rodeo family. Like my my parents are still into that cowboy kind of life and, you know, raising cattle and stuff. So uh, I like dropped out of school in like grade 10 and went straight to work. I didn't even think it was an option, you know, making this type of stuff, but I always nerded out over Lord of the Rings, Jurassic Park, like Star Wars, like all that type of stuff I always geeked out about. And uh, I just, I think at one point I kind of just said, you know what, like I want to do something in that and enrolled and got out here and started working and meeting some amazing people. And it's just been like a dream working at ILM to be able to actually like work on these projects that kind of like solid, you know, Mm -hmm. put so much inspiration into my childhood it's it's yeah it's pretty cool and, and for those who are not familiar ilm is industrial light magic it is you've got your lucas film yeah, my lucas film hat I'm, um, I'm a poor uh, representative apparently because i didn't, <laughs> I didn't <laughs> specify but yeah yes so, which uh you know we all know many of the properties uh from star wars um to the whole I guess Star Wars family these days of uh, multiple uh, multiple things happening and um, and I know uh, Abrao earlier again when we were talking you recognized Dane from speaking of networks and communities and, and you're yeah. from Brazil so really yeah. interested to hear your story mm -hmm. um, and how you know Dane and, and that sort of sense of community here. Yeah it's funny coincidence he it's here today as well like uh my history it's um a little bit different until the point that i meet uh that i met danny at ilm uh i started in 2010 back to brazil i finished my my graduation in propaganda because because it was the most different things from from the you know the jobs that i had in, uh, as opportunity in brazil so mm -hmm. i moved from my city to sao paulo where i stood in a, in a, i as crystal mentioned i guess and uh, I started to do some research about it because we don't have these options as we have here in Canada or uh, on the US, uh, a lot of difference in big studios. So I did my, my homework. I did some research back 2010 and I found this school in Brazil, uh, Melies, and uh, it's something very similar to what is uh, 
VFS, uh, Vancouver Film School, it's mm -hmm. here. So I, I did a year of uh, uh, a course there and it was great because I could understand all the process on the 3D animation. And back the time I didn't know what I wanna do, uh, but I, I really was always happy to see films on the theater, you know, like uh, was two feelings that I that I remember. I remember I was super excited to go in the theater and, and see the movie, but I, I get out from that that room upset and sad because I was like, how how do I how can I do something like this? I, I don't have I don't know how to do it in Brazil. So I I moved from my city. I studied there again, Sao Paulo, and then in 2000, like uh, 2015, I decided to to came and apply for a visa in Canada um, to starting to explore more because uh, I, I got my graduation in 2011, but uh, I started and I didn't have a portfolio. So I, I did a sharp move because again, I didn't know what I want. I just wanna do movies and animation. And when mm -hmm. I got that, I saw that was very, it's not easy. It uh, wasn't easy as I was as I was expecting, but I understand and I really got a, a, a passion from modeling. And uh, since from that, I started to do more, more and more characters. I work as a freelancer. Uh, and until uh, 2015, again, uh, I got this option to apply for a visa here that called self-employed. It's, it's a sort of visa uh, that, that allows you to come to Canada as a PR already. Uh, but I wait for, for with my wife like around two years until I got my PR and be able to come here. Um, and since, then, since uh, from that time, I used work in some outsourcing company here and then I started I work at Microsoft as a character artist and then I jumped to LM when I found this guy uh, Danny and uh, <laughs> he helped me a lot there uh, I, I work as a senior creative artist back then uh, but for was for a short amount of time because I had a chance to to go to EA games, work on the dice on the Battlefield franchise uh, it's funny fact I, I didn't update you Prem, but I, yeah. I recently last week I moved and I'm in the new studio today and that calls Respawn. Uh, Congratulations! <laughs> yeah, and uh, on, it's funny that right now I'm back on the Star Wars franchise again. Oh, <laughs> Not yeah. on the franchise, but uh, you know, like I work on the Space Jam uh, at mm -hmm. ILM was great, yeah. and now I'm back on the uh, on the spirit of like ILM, but it's in the gaming industry. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I do want to um, get into that a little bit. There is a lot of crossover between people moving. We also have a very strong and vibrant video game industry here um, in BC, and a lot of people do move back and forth um, between the two. And it's also interesting what you're saying is that a lot of, um, and I don't know, Heather, if you can maybe speak to this a little bit, is that you have large companies like Sony and Industrial Light and Magic, Atomic Cartoons, but often a lot of the, you may still be working on something like a, a Star Wars or a different uh, a project for a large company, even as a small studio. Did you file, find that that sort of helped in building your company? Oh yeah, I mean, brands always help um, to build you know, who you are as a company. If somebody trusts you with their big brand, um, like Mattel and Netflix are doing with Crystal and I right now <laughs> on their new uh, Barbie series. It really helps to like know the crew that are coming to work with you, know that you're being entrusted with a big brand. So um, yeah, brands always help. And so do the independent projects. Like when we get to create our own series and say, this came from like within these walls and we went out and you know, sold it to a network that also gets people really excited as well. Um, so yeah, I think that's something that we always think about when we're um, taking on a project because mm -hmm. there are so many uh, anim amazing animation studios in town. But one of the things that we always think about is like, who are we going to get to work on this? Like mm -hmm. who every, it's an artist market out there right now. It's a production person's market. Um, there are not enough people to fill all the positions at all of the studios. So one of the big questions that we ask is like, who's going to want to work on this project? Right. Um, mm -hmm. And often that is the actual, what is the property? Can you, um, you or Crystal speak to a project I'm personally interested in is Deepa and Anoop. Um, I think it's currently in production or just, yeah. yes. 
Yeah, I'll give the producer side and then Crystal can share yeah. <laughs> the more fun part, the creative part. Um, but yeah, it's an original IP that was um, brought to us from Mattel. It's not a toy property, which is quite uncommon when the toy companies come to us. And it's an original series that's going to air on Netflix, I think later this year. I don't think we have an official um, uh, launch date yet, but it's it's really adorable. And yeah, I'll let Crystal share more about the content of the show and her role on it. Yeah, so uh, Deepa and Anoop is a, a new IP from Mattel and it's about um, a little girl and her family, and they are a multi-immigrant generation family, and it's really exciting because we got to work on something that's completely brand new. Uh, I was part of the pre-development where we got to really have a say within our studio about how the characters looked and how we were going to represent diversity in the whole cast, and it, it was just really exciting, and I think one thing about it being not a toy product is that we really got to spearhead a lot of the design instead of being given, here are these toys we already have. Now, what can you do to make them animation friendly? Um, so yeah, I got to design the half of the main cast and each episode has a Bollywood musical number. And I got to um, really Love design <laughs> all of the, yeah, like all of the uh, music and the, not the music, but like the musical backgrounds. Yeah. And it's just, it's really exciting. I can't wait for it to come out. Yeah, that's pretty exciting. I um, have uh, young nieces and I know they're one of their, Mira the Royal Detective is, I think it's Disney, I think it's Disney, um, is a young South Asian girl, little girl, but I think they're probably outgrowing it. So it's probably time for, for something like this as they get older. Um, Lori, I'm really curious what you're seeing kind of around the world, given that you have so many touch points through Scanline in terms of talent and what you're looking for and where, um, where you still, still see gaps in some sense. Well, I mean, I don't know if it's entirely the same on the animation side for my co-panelists, but for, certainly on the visual effects side, it's a artist market. There are more jobs than there are candidates. It's insanely competitive. Um, often I, <laughs> I find we'll negotiate with somebody right up to the edge and then they'll say, great, I'm gonna take this offer and shop it around, I'll get back to you. Um, which certainly is complex and more difficult. I think one of the unique things about Scanline is we really do encourage people to go beyond the silo of the role that they're in. Mm -hmm. So if you demonstrate passion and knowledge and ability, you can really do almost anything at our company. So when we're hiring people, we're looking for, you know, self-starters, self people who are motivated and people who aren't necessarily, you know, um, hung up on just doing one individual thing and only that. Um, one of the complexities of the current COVID world is most of our studios are closed, as I can see from Heather and, mm -hmm. um, and because of that, people are working remotely, which for our senior staff, they really enjoy it. They get to have more time with their family. Um, and it's been profound for them. But with our sort of junior and entry level staff who are our future and, you know, really quite important, our stars of the future, they're missing out on that mentorship opportunity, that one on one, that, you know, the way that you often learn. I mean, everybody learns differently, but mm -hmm. you know, it's by walking around and seeing how other people are working and asking questions. And so missing out on that is something that we're very challenged by right now. And we're trying to figure out as we move forward, how we can create a paradigm where we can sort of serve both of these two desires. I can speak as like a senior saying that, yes, wow. I'm happy about working for from home <laughs> just because it's like, you know, kid is here and you know if, like you know my my family so it's easy to just kind of like you know it's a lot nicer to not you know cut out that hour or hour and 20 you know commute time and just spend with them but I definitely hear what you're saying especially with like new people coming in it can be very tough to try and juggle that awesome work culture that you typically have in studio oh I agree I appreciate your insight mm -hmm. even you know even though we pair people up with mentors it's, it's not the same thing. I mean, for myself, I, you yeah. know, I came back to Scanline in the midst of this COVID and, you know, I, I haven't face-to-face -face met all of these new people and the people mm -hmm. I work with. And, you know, you're sort of always like, 
judging your own humor or sarcasm or you know how things are interpreted um so for somebody who's brand new in the industry and just getting started and very excited uh i i, I can't imagine how challenging it is to sort of be um you know working from home mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah i think a lot of people are trying to you know, there's pros and cons and it's like, what does this hybrid look like for all of us? And, you know, going at whatever, right? We're not out of COVID necessarily, but into this next phase of our pandemic life. Um, Crystal, did you want to say something on this subject? I wasn't sure you were off mute for a second, but. Oh, uh, no, I just forgot to yeah. mute myself. <laughs> no, but feel free to chime in. We do have a question, which I think, um, you know, Lori, Clara, Heather, you, or anybody really, but. The question is, how competitive is it for product for the production side entry level roles in both animation and visual effects? So, you know, I guess assuming that, um, you know, it's interesting in the physical production side, you can really you can there are opportunities to enter as a PA as a production assistant and kind of figure out what different jobs might be, even if you don't necessarily have that specific education. Um, I don't know if it works exactly the same way in uh, visual effects and animation, but um, Lori, would you mind taking a stab at this and pass oh, it? To sure. Us? Yeah. And then, and then hopefully I can hear the other side from from Heather on the animation. Yeah. Um, you know, for us, the PA, the that's an entry level position on the production side. We. Um, absolutely treat it that way. We are here to like sort of train and guide those people. We try to bring them in at an entry level salary because we feel like we're actually providing some education and learning and, um, but there's a rapid growth from there as well. If you can demonstrate your skills and being a PA at our, at our company, you could do almost anything to get started. Um, but I can tell you that people grow, like my manager of recruiting uh, came in two and a half years ago and was building desks. So um, there's a tremendous opportunity. <laughs> like actual physical desks? Yeah, we all did. Oh, I built desks okay. <laughs> in LA 12 years ago too. Startup life, right? That's, <laughs> that's yeah. great. Yeah, totally. I think I started as a PA as well, emptying the garbage cans. And if you're like that eager person that just looks around and go, Ooh, I could probably help over there. I could probably help over there. It is the best way to like learn the industry. And I think if you can just take on those PA jobs, um, it's a great place to just, yeah, really understand the inner workings without having to like commit to, you know, a huge role. You can learn a lot. Um, and I, I don't, I think we've hired maybe five PAs over the last year and a half. Um, we need you. Yeah. I think all, all the studios need, need you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. yeah. In the last week. <laughs> yeah. oh, wow. Um, Clara, I'm interested in, you know, uh, from a CG, especially like, you know, it's, it's a more specialized, um, department do you how does you know what what is the trajectory for someone like what is the minimum sort of in this department that you would see people needing um really people come from different backgrounds and different levels um depending on which particular job you're looking for um, you have to have a portfolio a demo reel that fits that job description mm -hmm. um we have like software developers who came in as uh, we call it the production services department. Um, they help us um, manage the render farm. We have uh, junior artists, lighting artists, effects artists, modelers, and all kinds of physicians. And even some PAs, they started as a PA, but they are actually a great artist themselves and they mm -hmm. would move on to different fields. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, anything is possible. Yeah, yeah. So I think, you know, one of the, again, the, um, the ideas behind Creative Pathways is that we have a, we have a lot of demand for the talent here in, in BC um, in terms of both physical production, independent production, animation, visual effects, video games, and we need more people. Uh, we want, you know, this is really the idea of bringing this group together is just giving an initial, like, these are the, you know, some of the types of people and, and the interesting folks that you would work with and meet, but also the, the opportunities, you know, can be, you know, it's really up to you as an individual to really 
uh, be able to build on those opportunities. I think Abra, what you were speaking to, maybe you can talk a little bit more about that connection between, you know, from Microsoft to EA, <laughs> Um, to also, you know, doing some work for, uh, sorry, you're at Ripple Effect, did you say you're at Ripple Effect Studios now? I was at you Ripple okay. right now. I, 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 um, today I'm working at Rispal. It, it is oh, still right, EA, sorry. Rispal uh, is to entertainment. Uh, okay. They are, people know uh, them for mainly for Apex, the game. I don't know if you guys know about it, but it's uh, uh Battle Royale game that is very famous on the on the market right now, but beside that they they had they produced the the Jedi Fall Order that is a new game that makes a lot of success on, on the on the market as well. But talking about this transition between uh, uh, between those you know animation uh, or gaming or VFX, for me it's because it was always related to modeling. It's very it's one of the areas that you can do this uh, this jump or change if you want between those uh, those areas of your facts or collectible, for example. I work a little bit for a bit for uh, collectible companies doing characters like this that they mm -hmm. you know they do the the main one and they go for production and they sell them as a piece of art that you put in your house. But yeah, and and in some part of my process of modeling that what the same thing that Dan does is like, uh, it's very similar, right? Like there are some different like uh, approaches when you go to gaming that mm -hmm. you, you you need to worry more about the, the, the technical side, you know, like the numbers of uh, poly count, poly count is the number of, uh, you know, polygons that your character has because this is gonna like, this is gonna uh, uh, affect directly the perform the, the game uh, in, in terms of like uh, it's too heavy, it's not, you know, like and, and for the, the 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 movies and for production that we call or VFX, uh, there there are more freedom in terms of like limitation. I I need to worry mm -hmm. about it, but it's it's way more free because it's mm -hmm. this go for a render farm uh, that are gonna use a lot of PCs. So there are some difference, but when we talk about modeling character artists, that is exactly what I do. Uh, you can you can walk perfect between those different areas because in the the main core of what we do, it's modeling, right? So uh, uh, it's just uh, the the workflow that change a little bit. But and for me, what's easier to jump between those areas because I'm really mm -hmm. passionate about modeling, uh, and uh, yeah, it's it's what's easier for me. But I know that for animation, uh, can be the same. Uh, I don't know, people, the team around me can talk better about mm -hmm. it. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, like and, and the the main difference that I see uh, that I saw between, for example, gaming industry and the the VFX, it's is like. Uh, now I, I maybe it's because VFX is starting early, way early than you know the 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 game, and mm -hmm. I saw the pipeline how gigantic it is on ILM for example. They have a very solid pipeline, uh, and the game is still learning from that. You know, like and and we can see today that the tech it's getting high that people is starting to do is starting to move from the the, the vfx and jump into mm -hmm. the game industry because the quality and the you know the the hell, real time it's it's getting close and they are more worried about bringing those people that they have the knowledge you know like it's not just about the the tech but game it's very technical so mm -hmm. it, it's a plus that, that you need to adapt compared with vfx and uh uh and i don't know like for me today it's more horizontal the, the conversation then the vfx is more vertical because it is a movie right right it's, it's linear or is a tv show and uh, now uh, i have option to talk right. more and uh, decide better about things that i'm gonna do in my character or uh, i don't know a sword that he's gonna use it's too long it's too small you know things like this that that's interesting because it is um yeah a video game is not linear yeah, well, as far as I can ever get in the video game, it is. But uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, this, it's, this it's thing about the open world is changing completely, and is yeah. this new generation of game is getting the quality super high, and people yeah. can do crazy stuff. So I don't know. Um, thank you, Abrao. Um, Dane, I okay. think this might be an interesting question for you. Um, somebody's asking. They're currently applying 
for a creative VFX studio job. And they are curious about what the most, um, what are the elements that recruiters are looking for in a song demo reel? So I'm sure you come across uh, many reels. What stands out for you? Uh, it kind of depends on what the creative thing you're kind of going for. Um, like had been mentioned before, uh, you want to see a demonstration of obviously what you're wanting to hire them for that practice. And if you're if you're saying wanting to focus on you know environment stuff, you should have a lot of that reflecting and prop stuff, vehicle stuff, or creature or character stuff. You definitely want to have a a, a portfolio that reflects those. But also you want to have a, like a touch of uh, a touch of diversity as well, just to be able to actually show that because you, you know like. You, you can get in at any point, like, you know, I hear all this about everyone starting out as PA and stuff like you can, the industry is pretty diverse in what the type of workflows, setups, things you can do. And uh, it's also never boring because of that, but mm -hmm. you can, you kind of, you want to make sure that the person is, you know, semi adaptable for whatever kind of challenges that can be presented because they're, 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 every project kind of comes with new ones. And it's uh, always good to have whoever, whatever artist you're wanting to have to make sure that they, well, you know, have the uh, not maybe not the ability, but at least the uh, the incentivization, like that they the um, the drive to be able to actually do a lot of the a lot of things. Sorry, I'm tripping over my tongue a little. Yeah, bit. no, no, it's okay. <laughs> we all know it's probably been a long day. Um, yeah, for for most of you, um, what? How do you? Um, I guess support each other, you know, Jay, like in a studio as large as yours, Jay, and like where you are working on these massive projects. You know, when you do have that, like, uh, you know, I think just what I'm asking is how, just for people to understand what the environments are like, even in this virtual workplace mm -hmm. now, where you're not, you know, you can't see the to the person over there, like, hey, can you come over and look at this problem? I can't quite figure it out. How's how's that been working? Uh, it's been going all right, I think, because, uh, like, I don't know, I I think I've been very fortunate with working with ILM because we've um, we have like some of the most not only talented and like, you know, top tier artists and, and minds in, behind our studio, but they're also just amazing people to work with. And it's kind of been a big thing because whatever project I've been a part of, like I've, I've been at ILM now, oh, getting getting close to eight years, maybe. <laughs> And every every challenging show has kind of has come up has definitely been like doable because of a good attitude. I think we we've all kind of like we have a bit of camaraderie and like connection, and that workplace connection has kind of sadly been hard to keep maintained with new people coming in with the COVID, uh, you know, type of work style that we have. But I think we we're all still trying to be active in in group chats and and lots of other things like that to make sure that we have that sense of community which is really important i think especially working on such big projects because at the end of the day like you know it's we'll we'll, we'll get you through uh, almost any of these challenges will definitely be a good attitude and there are just again for people who may not be as familiar with the industry there is a chapter of women in animation here there's spark which is a visual effects and animation conference but also a group that puts on a lot of events throughout the year um, I just saw that the Vancouver International Film Festival is doing a talk next week with Domi Shi, who did, who's the, you know, the creator artist behind Turning Red. Um, so there are a lot of uh, places in this world that we're living in currently to, to try to learn and, and connect with people. And, and I really believe in the importance of that. Um, a question I think, you know, Lori, Clara, Heather might uh, have a really interesting perspective on is how reliant are you on endorsements and referrals from senior experienced people when you're hiring? Now, and what I'm hearing is you're really looking for people very actively all the time, but um, you know, we also know that a lot of this industry traditionally has been very, uh, who do you know and networked, but I don't know if that's exactly the same in you know, visual effects and animation. Laurie, what are your thoughts on this? You know, I live in a world where it's a meritocracy. And the most important thing about hiring somebody is they're real. The quality of their work. Um, and through that work, you can see their problem solving, their imagination. Um, there's a lot of, you know, when we do an interview, we really go through the real. We want to know how long something took. We want to know who you were collaborating with. And you know, of course, I think nepotism's always alive. It's how you get the door open. But 
we, I mean, I look at reels all day long. Anybody that's submitting on our website is going to get their work looked at. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean you'll always get a call back. It doesn't mean you'll always get an interview, but for sure, there's a pair of eyes looking at your work. And um, once you're past that phase, I, in all honesty, if you've worked at a place where we know somebody, we probably will want to find out what kind of a collaborator you are. But that's the impetus of the of the background check. It's not, you know, it's really the quality of your work that's going to open the door. But then we just want to make sure that you're going to be part of a team. Right. Yeah. No, thank you, Heather. What about in animation? Yeah, I'd say the same. I think, right, you know, I, when I started, it was about who you know for sure. It was it, like, who can give me a referral? It, does this person know this person? But we rarely rely on those sorts of recommendations anymore because it's not each project, each cohesion of a team is different there's different chemistry so like somebody could have had maybe a not great working experience with a particular supervisor but it doesn't mean that they're not an amazing artist and would thrive on another team mm -hmm. so for us similarly it's about the portfolio the work and attitude like come on in try your best and that will speak for itself it's not it's not who you know anymore yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Personally, um, I think, sorry, um, ahead, I think when I got my job at Sony, um, what helped me was because I have a short film that I made as a mm -hmm. student and it got into sick graph animation mm -hmm. theater. So that really kicked started my mm -hmm. career. So do something that stands out and got mm -hmm. into festivals that would certainly help. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That, that I mean, that goes back to like the beginning times of like, so when I started working in this sector, you know, over 20 years ago, that it was, you know, what your calling card, so to speak. Um, and I think that's kind of the, you know, at a, certainly at a very high level now, the Domi She story where she was an artist at Pixar and did a short and, you know, things moved on from there. And I think we are living in also in a world now where there's you know, stories that are coming from places we haven't seen before, thankfully. And, um, you know, that is so interesting. Um, Crystal, I have somebody who wants you to come and speak to their class, so we'll connect you with them um, <laughs> after, which I think would be amazing. Um, but also the, the question is um, from uh, somebody who teaches at Vancouver Film School in, in the writing department. Um, some of the students are writing animated TV shows at the moment. Um, what advice would you give soon to graduate students, uh, soon to graduate students, as steps to take if they're wanting to pitch their TV series to a studio? Now, this is a big question, but Crystal, you're you're probably the closest to just finishing school um, as part of the group here. What? Uh... Yeah, um, I feel like actually that Heather would have a really good answer for this because she has done pitch packages and she has had to pitch shows. Uh, me personally, I haven't had to do that, but for uh, general advice when, you know, being a graduating student um, is stay curious and ask people questions. Like I, one thing that I think really helped me when I was an intern at Kickstart is that, you know, especially since I didn't go to animation school, when I started, I didn't know anything. And I asked everybody, what are you working on? What do you do here? How did you get into your job? And I've kind of kept doing that, even like being not an intern anymore and like, you know, being a more senior artist, I still constantly ask my peers like, hey, what are you guys working on? Like, how's it going? And, and I think for me, that's kind of helped me um, move up in my career as well because of I've shown that I am interested in the entire pipeline and not just what I do. And so I found, you know, what I'm good at, but I also constantly want to learn. And I think people really enjoy that. So when you're a student, when you graduate, don't think I'm not a student anymore. There is always room to keep learning. That is great advice. Um, so Heather, I mean, the pitching question is a big one, um, you know, when it comes to any kind of content, but, you know, where do people start that you've seen that you've seen some people have success or do they come to a company like yours or? 
Yeah, we, we do sometimes take submissions. I'm going to be honest. It is hard to sell a show. Like we are an established company and we are out there banging on the doors and trying to sell shows um, because these big broadcasters, they, yes, there's tons of content coming in from Disney and, you know, all of these, um, um, uh, SVOD players, subscription video on demand. Um, but there's still only a number of slots. So selling a show is hard, but that being said, that there are some great opportunities uh, to pitch ideas. I think, you know, CBC recently had a program. Mm -hmm. um, Netflix recently had an, another program where they were looking for, you know, general submissions to come in. And they looked at a lot of the pitches coming in and they gave feedback. I think there were people in our studio um, that had those meetings with Netflix, which was amazing to see, like they're looking for those properties. Um, Story Hive locally, um, I'm not sure if they're doing their animation program mm -hmm. still, but there are some great um, independent CMF, I think is still doing some independent um, uh, programs where you can submit your idea. And I think, you know, coming to the indie studios like myself, um, we are looking to put on kind of more daily or like community driven workshops of like what it takes to sell a show. We do that internally. Um, we say, whoever wants to figure out like what it takes to get a show developed, how much money do you have to put yeah. in? Um, who do you go to? Like, what is the process? We, mm -hmm. we have been a little bit more open about that in the last couple of years, sharing internally with our folks. Cause it's hard. I'm not going to lie. It's hard, yeah. um, but ideas come from everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. People can get their stuff out on YouTube. Like there's ways to get your stuff out there on TikTok, mm -hmm. on Instagram. Like if you're getting buzz, then people are going to want to hear about you. So yeah, just being a realist, though. Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, that's part of uh, the, the reality of the, the industry is that it's not all the uh, award shows and parties. Far from it, you know. Um, someone is asking um, what type of, what kind of major, like, I guess, uh, call it university degree, do you expect from a university student who's interested in virtual arts and animation? So I'm guessing, you know, uh, Crystal, you didn't have a specific degree in this area. Dane, you kind of found your way there, but yeah, just curious. And then from the higher is the same thing. Oh, sorry, uh, I was just gonna say, so I went yeah, to Capilano. Um, so my degree is a, a bachelor's in visual communications with a concentration in illustration. Um, so I think when I applied to Kickstart, I essentially just applied with my illustration portfolio. I had, you know, character design, prop design, environment design. Um, but I think in my career, so I generally, I use mostly my illustration skills, which I didn't really get from school, but my graphic design skills, I think really give me an edge where I am because it's not a skill set. Um, really anyone else in animation has. Like I have type, I've learned typography skills. I know how to use Illustrator and InDesign. Um, I've learned After Effects, which is just something that not people uh, really do. So I think that generally you don't need, I, in my opinion, even though I have a degree, I don't think you need a bachelor's. I don't think you need um, a full, to be fully certified. Uh, to get into the industry. I think a lot of people um, are able to get in on their portfolio and just like their personal skills. But if you have those things, it definitely gives you an edge and you should let people know that you have those skills. I was about to add kind of a similar mm -hmm. thing. Yeah, like I, I'm kind of in the, 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 the pit of that you don't really need probably like a, an official degree or major or any of that type of stuff. Um, what's kind of more important is I guess your portfolio and yeah. you know, what you can produce and showing, you know, you know, really well, well done, you know, uh, portfolio and like, you know, all that would just like is, is definitely enough to, to get in the industry, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I would Sorry, like to add. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's funny because it's a hundred percent true. Like, uh, and he's speaking for, from someone that comes from, a different place that is not Canada and, and US that is it's the you know is the place to find jobs uh, related to our industry um, it's funny because when I came when I was in Brazil and, and for us it's just about the portfolio and of course uh, uh, you know knowing to express yourself and talk uh, the, the language like that it's English mainly uh, 
when I was in Brazil, it was always this, like about our portfolio, just keep doing, uh, doing your portfolio, your art and your character or creating lighting uh, scenes you know, or short movies. But once I got here, uh, I, I, I realized that beside that, there is the, the recruiter, right? Like the, the, it's, that always, it's not always that he knows exactly uh, the high level artist that they want, he want to find. Uh, I believe that how, you know, after a while, when he become a senior, he's starting to get more into that. But the first person that we're going to talk probably, it is the recruiter, right? So you need a good presentation on LinkedIn or whatever place that you can, uh, you know, like present yourself better mm -hmm. uh, in your resume or uh, cover letter. And, and those things are really important as well. Like mm -hmm. uh, portfolio, 100%, but I would say that it's like 60, 40, uh, 60, 60 your portfolio of course and and for on those other things mm -hmm. and 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 be aware that you need to be a professional uh overall because uh, a lot of artists has this uh uh this uh approach where they think that they just need to do great art and they're going to be higher it, it, it's not like this we need to know if they are good co-workers uh if they are not normal people. It's, it's difficult to say that, but we can find really crazy people when you work at that. Sometimes they don't respect some, you know, probably yeah. it's, it's some, yeah. it's a combination. Example. Yeah. 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 So it's a combination of a lot of things that people need to know if you are a good person, if you're a nice guy or yeah. a girl that yeah. knows how to work in, in, a, in a team. Right. So it's yeah. a portfolio, but uh, trying to present your, yourself as a professional and knowing mm -hmm. about follow deadlines etc mm -hmm. yeah because yeah definitely like you have to keep in mind that like a lot of artists we typically are typically a little bit more like introverted and kind of like to do our own thing a lot of the time but the, you know these jobs are jobs and you work with teams and lots mm -hmm. of people and lots exactly. of creative others yeah. and collaboration is a huge importance yeah exactly. i mean i think that's thing clara what you were saying like the several hundreds of people that uh, brought us the spider verse that that is definitely you know collaboration is a key key item so we've only got a couple of minutes left I just want to you know again thank you anybody who tuned in this was just to give you a sampling of so many in-depth interesting potentials for multiple conversations that could uh, veer off from everything that we've learned today and you know consider this as a as an area uh, obviously there's all kinds of potential opportunities from, um, you know, everybody's interesting career journeys here. And um, I also think like, I think Clara, a lot of companies like Asoni, you also have, in addition, you also will teach people your proprietary uh, tools that you may use, right? So there's even more skills that you get skilled up when you join companies. Um, in the last minute here, I just invite everybody to kind of give one quick, uh, advice or idea or you know an optimistic note to to end on so Laurie do you mind if I start with you put you on the spot <laughs> sure um I think the most important thing really is just believe in yourself don't be afraid don't sabotage yourself you know put yourself out there and every opportunity that you have even if it doesn't end the way you want is an opportunity to learn something and move forward. So definitely everybody go to scanlinevfx.com. We have people coming in at all levels at our company and put yourself out there. Just, you know, go for it. Yeah, I like that. Thanks, Laurie. Clara? Yeah, um, Sony's hiring a lot of people. So check out imageworks.com. Um, <laughs> surround yourself with people who inspire you and who lift you up, not people who drag you down. Very nice. Crystal? Yeah, um, so I was gonna say too, like uh, what Abrao and Jane was saying, uh, it's very easy to just kind of keep your head down and just kind of wanna like work on your work. But even if you do amazing work, if you don't connect with your coworkers, people aren't gonna remember you. So, you know, don't be afraid, don't be shy. You know, talk to people, if, even if you're not in the industry yet ask questions. People love imparting their knowledge in my experience. So just make yeah. sure you always talk to people if you want to know what they're doing. Yeah. Uh, Dane? Uh, yeah, I'd say always stay curious because there's, this is an unbelievably competitive and also like, you know, amazing industry that always is evolving and always changing. And there's always going to be new technologies and everything. So 
always just always keep learning because you're never going to stop in this industry, which is also the best part of it. Thank you. Uh, Rao, did you want to add anything to what you said? Uh, yes, there are so many things, but I, I would say <laughs> keep, uh, keep your, your goals, uh, trying to do not believe just in motivation, more in discipline, uh, be aware that most part of your career you or before you achieve your goals to uh, be working in a company that you always dream to work uh, you're gonna probably stay away for a while for some parties or events uh, it's common but you you're gonna <laughs> you're gonna achieve your, your your goal for sure and uh, keep motivated and the the, the Clara uh, tip was amazing so uh, I mean uh, if you find a group that likes the same thing you do, just keep in touch with them because this is yeah. super important, right? Like mainly in days to as as we live in on the COVID and all every time alone. So just keep them motivated and, and chat with them on Discord and whatever uh, place that you can find them. Yeah. Great. Thank you. And Heather, final uh, word to you. I think the panel covered it and stay curious. Yeah. <laughs>